Well, I'm really excited tonight because many of you may have been listening to our Q&A podcast led by Thomas Black, the amazing intern. And tonight we actually have a live Q&A panel. So I'm going to hand it over to Tom now and he will introduce this amazing panel. Thanks, Tom. Everybody as well. Uh, as Amy said, my name is Thomas. I'm a ministry intern here. And um, we've actually got a live audience, which is great. And I'm glad that everybody can be tuning in online as well. Um, we're actually going to be having a live panel. And I'm going to introduce uh, those guys to you first. Firstly, we have uh, Nicholas Tui, who is the senior minister at Q Baptist Church. Also, we have uh, a live panel on Zoom, which I currently concealed. Oh, no, here we go. Did we do yeah. the text questions? Yes. We, oh, yeah. we did. Sorry. Yes, we also want to invite you guys into the panel as well. So, if you have questions, um, please text them through. We have question, the phone number here, 0420543361. So, if you want to um, ask any questions of the panelists, please do that. I've got the phone here, and we'll try and get to, to as many of those as possible. Now, on to the other people who are on the panelists, on the panel. We have, here we go. So we've got Ken Manley, who is a uh, professor of history and an author of numerous books. We also have Ashray, who is a medical doctor. Dr. Raja Gopalan. Dr. Raja Gopalan. That's exactly right. <laughs> and we have um, also Miriam Dale, who is a poet and a educator. And it's so good to have these guys uh, joining with us. Um, just Mir a bit of Miriam's coming. Miriam will be here soon. Just a bit of background on why we're doing this uh, panel. There's so much going on in uh, our society at the moment on many different fronts, on heaps of different issues. And tonight we wanted to have a conversation rooted in 1 Peter, which is the sermon series that we're going through, um, about this current cultural moment that we find ourselves in. So what wisdom does the Bible have and how can we bring that uh, to bear on these topics? How can Christians engage in all these uh, different issues, and how does the good news of Jesus actually uh, allow Christians to be reconcilers and bridge builders in our society? These are some things we want to tackle tonight, and um, let's bring the panel in now. Here's Miriam. Have we lost Ashray? Okay. We'll continue, go straight through. Hi, Miriam. Miriam, you're on screen. <laughs> Hi, Ken. Hi, Nick. Hi, Miriam. We can't hear Miriam. Have you, yeah, unmute. There we go. There Beautiful. We go. Hey, Miriam. Good to see you. And Ashray must be off screen somewhere. Anyways, we'll go on to the first question. So, over the last two weeks, we have uh, been looking at 1 Peter, which is a letter written by the early Christian leader, uh, the Apostle Peter, and he is writing to a persecuted minority Christian community. And the, this community was going through a time of intense uh, change and upheaval and uncertainty. And Peter focuses on the living hope, the salvation, the spiritual joy that we can have in Jesus. But interestingly, uh, Peter doesn't focus on the uh, specific material struggles or wider cultural issues that are going on. So I guess my question to the panel is... Why do you think Peter, writing to a community that is uh, in a real time of struggling, uh, struggle, um, why does he focus on the, the gospel first and not speak directly into the situation? And a second question would be, how does that inform us as Christians today? I'll throw that to you, Nick. Oh, to me? Oh, gosh. Look, I must say, I, I maybe handled that question a bit to Tom. Um, so, uh, there's a bit of my... Uh, sort of thoughts in that question. I uh, want to say that uh, it, it struck me that there's a lot of stuff going on in the first century Rome. There's all sorts of injustices, if you like. There's all sorts of tensions, ethnically, racially, class systems, uh, all sorts of ways that people, there's slavery, you know, there's a lot of corruption and injustice happening. And it struck me that Peter doesn't spend much time in his letter trying to get the Christian community to respond to all of these issues and to have a position on everything. 
Um, it's not that they're unimportant, that God doesn't care, but it, it seems to be like he wants to, he wants to, ha- he wants to speak into the hearts of the people and, and know that the ultimate, the ultimate hope that we have and the ultimate uh, goal of our faith is, is to be centred in God and to have him at the centre of our lives, to be walking in his love and his light. And I think he knows if he can get the Christian community focused on the truth of who Jesus is, of who they are, are focused on their role as, as, as missionaries, as people who are salt and light in the culture, that eventually that's going to arise and, and, and permeate the culture and, and change things kind of from within um, by the way they live, the way they respond. So I think that's why he talks a lot to them about their, their posture in their faith, their hope, uh, the way that they, they need to live lives of love and humility. Uh, and I think that's part of it. So you're saying the like he speaks to the internal reality, which will affect the external I think uh, situation. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. What What do you guys think on the panel? Yeah, I um. Well, I agree with a lot of what Nick has said. I think the one thing I would add, or a couple of things, is just I think it's important to note that Peter does name and acknowledge suffering that is going on. So he refers to it. He talks about what does it mean to be a church in suffering. So this isn't Peter in denial. This is Peter saying, I see what's going on, and actually I want to talk about the most important thing, which will equip you to deal with what's going on. Mm. Um, and I think he, the things that we give the most airtime are often the things that have the most power in our lives, um, and I think that's kind of how it can apply to today as well, mm. in that it's good to name and acknowledge and grieve the things that are hard and difficult. It's really important to do that. God grieves as well, and we need to grieve with him. But... Um, if we see those before we see Jesus, if we see them as bigger than Jesus, then we're missing the point and we're not equipped to respond to them. And I think that's why Peter's focusing on who is Christ, what does it mean to be safe in him first, uh, to be identified in him first. Yeah, that's really good, Miriam. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to just take a little bit of an issue with your perspective, Nick. Uh, that's good. Having me some tension here. He speaks to them about their faith and asserts their identity as believers, and that's basic, and I agree with you and all of that. But he does go on later on in the letter, and I don't know whether we're going to come to this later. In fact, he does address most of the issues uh, around the society in which they live. For example, he actually tells them to honour the emperor. (laughs) Now, if the dating is correct, and this was written by Peter, before he dies, so evidently then we're talking about Nero, a horrible emperor by any chance, and he tells them to honour the emperor, and he goes on, you may recall, he talks about uh, relationships between husbands and wives and about slaves and masters. So there's a sense in which he does address their circumstances, and in fact, we I don't know whether you want to come to that later, but it's from the perspective of the fact that they are now new people they are now those people who were once to use the image that he uses uh, from, from the Old Testament. Once they were no people, now they are his people. Mm. They are now aliens and exiles, yet living in a real world with a horrible emperor, and, and they could be slaves. Many of them undoubtedly were. But it's the, the fact that their identity in Christ that is crucial to how they live out their lives in the time of suffering and indeed, in, if you like, in the structures within which they, they have to live. I, I, I just want to add that in because I think you, I know, don't think this, but it's important that we don't give the impression that these things aren't important. Mm. They are important and they do raise some issues for us about how we might relate to them ourselves today. But mm. Peter does address very specifically what should, how Christians should live within the the structures of society in which they are placed. How would you respond to that? I res- respond by saying I'm glad someone bit because I, I purposely left some things off there. I, I have my, my, my note here which says, Peter does talk about slavery, suffering, persecution, marriage, family and other things briefly. So he does uh, definitely and so the first couple of chapters of the letter which we've been in, he, he does focus on that identity stuff but... Um, I guess for me it was more a sense of it's it's not it's not comprehensive or it, it's not 
um, and I, I'm probably leading into where we're going with this discussion, maybe talking about some particular social issues um, where he, he's not kind of rallying the troops to, to form, um, you know, formal responses and, and, and complex engagement with these issues, um, though he is, he is a past, he's a pastor, so he's not, a, he's not trying to, um, you know, uh, organise them socially, but he is speaking to the situation, but not with a lot of detail. I guess that was the point, so, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate those thoughts. We'd like to just um, shift gears slightly, maybe start speaking into some of those specific issues, and I guess uh, across history, uh, Christianity has uh, sometimes been used as a tool of oppression, actually, and uh, th- those things are significant and real and um, and not in accordance with Christianity. But how does the good news of Jesus actually um, speak into issues of justice such as um, racial reconciliation, which are manifesting today and have manifested throughout all of history? Uh, how, do- how does the gospel of Jesus speak to those those topics? Let's start with you, Ashray. Yeah, well, I think it's... It sort of ties into what we were saying earlier in that um, in that the gospel of Jesus isn't primarily about an earthly reality. Um, I think, and I think this is partly what we see in, in what Peter's actually saying, is that believing in Jesus and living like Jesus is actually to turn, to turn your, uh, your focus of your life away from your away from other things and towards God. And that actually has a flow-on effect into the way you treat other people. It has a, and when, when people are oriented towards God, they're actually, part of that orientation is also to be oriented well towards each other. But perhaps part of the reason why, why that's not the focus of Peter's letter is that it's actually, um, like the, the, the problem of persecution is, is a real problem, but it's not, the, it's not that their main objective in life is to be safe in their bodies. Their, their main objective in life is to give glory to God and to be, to be living lives that actually live out the purpose that God has for people. So I think, I think that insofar as, uh, as the gospel speaks into problems like, uh, like conflict and racial issues and persecution, I think we can really see through a gospel lens how those arise from sin and, and the brokenness of, of the world and division and people's own selfishness. Um, and I think though it's really important that the gospel gives, uh, gives an answer that's not, um, like it's not just about racial harmony. It's not, it's not an answer that just enables people to live side by side. It's an answer that actually enables all things and all people to be in in righteousness at the end of the day. Everyone to be in right relationship with with God and with uh, with God's creation and and other people. And that's actually the the objective of the gospel. So it's actually much much greater than what a lot of um, I think what what we even think of as mm. racial harmony. Mm. So are you saying that uh, the gospel of Jesus deals with uh, the reconciliation of a um, more important reality, the, the, the relationship between God and man, and that actually has a flow-on effect to the way that we relate to our fellow man horizontally. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I, I guess I am. Um, I think my, my point is that it, it's a lot more, it's, it's a lot broader than, um, than you know, fixing, um, fixing problems of racial disparity, which are real problems. Mm. But it's really addressing the root problem that that all of these divisions stem from, which is the human heart and um, and selfishness and uh, and divisions and not being right with with God and not being right with other people. How would other people on the panel respond to that question and to what Ashray has said? Um, yeah, I I really like Ashray's response. I think. Um, I was thinking earlier about this question and I thought when when Christianity has been used as a tool of oppression and it has and it's important to name that um, I think that happens when we lose sight of who Jesus was which and I sort of wrote down characteristics 
um, a non-white born into poverty, powerful but meek, born into persecution, holy and son of God. Um, and so when, when we forget who he was on this earth and who he was as um, a God who detests sin and yet um, is immersed in sinners and yet is um, not born into privilege and not born into um, kinship, which he deserved, um, when we forget those things, that's when it's possible for Christianity to be used as a tool of oppression. And if we're preaching a Christianity that creates those uh, that system, then we're preaching Jesus wrong. Um, and I would say we've missed who he is, um, and maybe we need to get to know him better. So I think I think it's just good to name that and to say that that's really awful that it happens, and it's not what Jesus represents. It's not through the whole of the Bible we see. Um, the story of Israel is about not about Israel versus other nations. It's about um, Israel being a witness. And you see the people who have come in. You've got Ruth and Rahab, Melchizedek, and the Ethiopian eunuch, and all of the centurions, um, and the Greek widows, and all of these people who are welcomed into the community of Israel and then the community of the church uh, because of their interaction with Yahweh um, and because of his relationship with them. Uh, so it's fairly clear biblically that there is not a framework um, for racial discrimination and I think an imperative against it and an imperative for the church to act against it and for Israel um, was called against it to act against it as well. So I think if we're living within that narrative which God has laid out for us, then we need to be thinking about um, how are we pushing against those narratives that exist in society because, as Ashray said, um, this comes down to we have sinful hearts and um, we like to be in control and we like to be in power um, and we don't like to be afraid and those things make us push others away and those things make us oppress. Um, so I think when we immerse ourselves in that sense of the bigger biblical narrative and the person of Jesus, um, that's what pushes against both what's happening in our own hearts uh, and what happens in society as well. And I think the only other thing I wanted to kind of really point out is that there's a big template in the Old Testament in particular for um, corporate repentance for corporate sin. Um, and a lot of the Psalms talk about what does that look like. And I think that's important to think about for us today as well. Yeah, that's really great, Miriam. And just off that, um, and this is, I'll extend this to everyone else on the panel as well. Um, Ken, well, Ken, were you about to jump in there? Well, I was, but, but you press on. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe this will be a question, something you can answer. Uh, what I was going to say was, uh, how do we balance as Christians um, the reconciliation between um, and ensuring people are reconciled with God, like, like wanting people to enter into this relationship with God um, versus trying to also reconcile relationships with those around us, which include racial reconciliation, which is important and necessary. How, how do we balance those? Is, is it just something we both go for at the same time? Or how would you speak to that, Ken? Well, I, I think that feeds into the previous question, actually. Um, you see, when we talk about Christianity oppressing, we're, I think, giving a rather simplistic reading of, of history. That's how it's often pre presented, I will admit, when people criticise the church. But Christendom was an historical phenomenon. And uh, mm -hmm. we, we have to make a distinction. Indeed, the Reformation came about in part because many believers said, this is not what we read in our Bibles as to what the church should be. And, and so they, they sought to change it. You see, in Peter... But they, they are drawn back again to pick up on Miriam's point. They're drawn back to the story of the Old Testament, which feeds directly into their situations. Now, it's curious. We actually know nothing, virtually nothing, about these Christians that Peter is writing to. We don't know any famous saints or when the gospel came to them. But it's interesting that, that Peter picks up the language of the Old Testament. You are aliens and exiles. You are the new people of God who have to offer priestly sacrifice. All this is Old Testament, isn't it? And the thing that I, it came to me as we were thinking about these questions was something in the book of Jeremiah. Because speaking of them as, as exiles, of course, harks back to the time when Israel was carted away to Babylon and they were called to live in this hostile, foreign, critical place. And what did Jeremiah say to them? The prophet. Chapter 29, he says, Seek ye 
the welfare, seek you the shalom, the peace of the city where I've placed you. You know, have families, good gardens, build houses. You live seemingly like everybody else, but you are actually working for the peace, the wholeness, the shalom of the community. And that I think has been part of the mission of the church. Right from the beginning, Christians weren't marked by a great deal of, of outward difference. This inner dynamic is crucial to, to their identity, of course. But may I read you something which comes just called the letter to Diognetus. We don't know much about it, but it addresses a similar situation that Peter's readers found themselves in. If you allow me to read this. Go for it. Christians are not marked out from the west of mankind by their country or their speech or their customs. They dwell in cities, both Greek and barbarian. Each as his lot is cast. They inherit the lands of their birth, but as temporary residents thereof, they take their share of all responsibilities as citizens and endure all disabilities as aliens Every foreign land is their native land, and every native land is foreign land. They pass their days upon earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Mm. Now, that's how it was for the early church, and the same spirit, I think, is evident here. Mm. You see, Peter didn't say to them, all right, you slaves, you're free in Christ, uh, you know, get out of this, knock the system, knock the masters. We know where that would have ended. Various slave revolutions occurred in the Roman Empire. He didn't say to wives, no, you're equal in Christ. Therefore, forget about the kind of traditional loyalties that you have. The emperor, where you are, you have to acknowledge him. Now, we struggle with all that that might have meant for them, but the fact is they were called to seek the shalom. They had a new identity, they had a new dynamic, and they had to witness to that, not by if you like, social revolution. Mm. But of course, the changes came through Christianity, mm. if you like. Uh, slavery was eventually defeated by the principle that was there in the New Testament. The equality of women was there. It took perhaps centuries for that to come to full expression, but the principles were there. But the way in which Peter advises these Christians living in their situations was be faithful to your calling, know who you are as God's people, live within those structures, and God will bring change in his time. That's really, really good, Ken. How would you speak to that, uh, Nick? It, look, it's great what everyone has said. And uh, interestingly, in, in our culture, we seem to be um, fragmenting more along all sorts of different lines, whether they be race, sexuality, whatever it might be. We, we, it seems to be a tribalism has emerged over the last 10 to 20 years in the West particularly. And it's interesting how Christianity came onto the scene in, in the early centuries and, and really spoke powerfully into those divisions of race and socioeconomic things and gender and, and created a, a, a new story, a narrative that, that brought people together and that people weren't primarily having to identify with a particular group or a particular... Uh, whatever it might be, station in life. Uh, and I think there's a revolutionary nature in Christianity. We shouldn't forget that. It's a, but it's a mustard seed revolution. It's not the kind of burn down buildings and, and march in the streets violently revolution. It's, it's a mustard seed revolution where Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. You know, that the seed is planted in someone's life and heart. The seed is planted in the culture, in the city, in the village, in the home. And eventually it grows and it grows. It looks insignificant and people don't really take notice of it, the, the powerful emperors. I mean, where is Nero now? You know, where are the powerful Roman empires? They don't, they don't last. Empires don't last. They come and go. Emperors come and go. But here, here the mustard seed revolution continues, the powerful revolutionary message of Jesus which can transform people from within and change people who are enemies 
into friends, change people who, who hate one another traditionally and because of their culture or race or religion and, and make them brothers and sisters. So it is revolutionary, but it's not overtly violent revolutionary. And, and in a way, there's times when Christianity, I think, it, it self-critiques itself. And that's why I love that through the Reformation, as, as Ken taught me as my um, lecturer in Bible college, you know, through the Reformation, Martin Luther... The German reformer brought the scriptures to the people. He was the first one to translate the Bible into the language of the common people. And since then, you know, people like William Tyndale and others, we all read the Bible, we have the Bible, but for 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 years, the average Christian person didn't have access to the Bible. And so there's a sense now in which we can let the Bible self-critique us and critique the church and keep bringing us back to that that revolutionary nature of Jesus' message and kingdom. Yeah, that's that's great, Nick. And I just want to pick up on one uh, thought that you had in there uh, as we close. Uh, there's often a wide variety, a, a diversity of opinions that exist in wider society and also uh, in the church. How do um, Christians maintain uh, a, a unity, a family unity as brothers and sisters while having all these um, diverse political and theological views it's more of a broad question and i guess practically off that looking at that unity how do we actually engage with culture when a lot of that is primarily on social media and Mm. uh, so i guess my question is we have a diversity of of opinions how do we as christians um, maintain unity and engage with those issues um, on social media where this discussion is primarily playing out it's a good question i'll just jump in and say anyone here if you've got questions Give us a wave. We've got about another eight, eight or nine minutes, maybe ten. Uh, so if you do have some questions or text them in, uh, anything specifically, we're trying to keep it a bit general tonight and Tom's doing a great job with that. But if you do have some specific things, um, get them in. But I'll, I'll hand back over to the panel for your question, Tom, about how to, how to cultivate our, our oneness in Christ, our unity, even though we might differ on different social things or how to respond to different social situations. Good question. Can I throw to you, Ashray? I think there's a very interesting um, question here, which the church has actually struggled with for, for pretty much since its, since its birth, which is what is actually, um, which are the first order issues and which are the second order issues? And what are the issues that, um, that we should, you know, go to metaphorical battle over and sometimes real battle? And uh, what are the issues which we should, you know, put aside for the sake of unity? Um, Nick mentioned the uh, the Protestant Reformation, and that's it's it's an interesting question as well. Was was that the the a good outcome that uh, that the Protestant Church split off from the Church that was called the Catholic Church, the Universal Church? Um, and I, I don't think we have time to to go into the Protestant Reformation in any level of detail at all this evening. But um, I guess ultimately you have to draw the line somewhere. And and I think different people probably have different views on where to draw the line is the thing and what what actually constitutes an essential article of faith and what what, uh, is a disputable matter. as far as how we engage, though, I think that's much easier than um, than that question, which I, I would just summarize as to speak the truth in love. I think um, I think we have an obligation to speak the truth, and also an obligation to speak the truth with love. And uh, I think um, mm. re- respectful conversation is is really the the best way mm. to engage uh, both. As Christians, as as ambassadors for Christ, um, in in the public square. Yeah, that's really good, Ashray. And I feel like often on social media we speak our own interpretation of the truth without love, so it gets quite mixed quite quickly. But how would uh, other guys on the panelists uh, speak to that first point that Ashray raised? I think it's a really good point about what what are our first tier issues and what are those. Uh, second tier issues or another way of speaking about it, what are the closed handed issues and what are the open handed issues and or I guess maybe how do we define those is probably an easier question. I love that you're framing it as an easy question. Um, yeah, there's, there has been other discussions across millennia of church history. Um, 
But I think the unifying feature and the one that we can stick to is uh, the person and nature of Christ. And I think um, when we start from that point, we will have disagreements about other things. And that's a kind of a guarantee. But there's a reason why the church is described as a family, because in a generally healthy family, um, you disagree and yet you can't really get rid of each other. You can't um, say, I'm not related to this person anymore. You have to learn how to talk to each other. You have to learn how to work it through. Um, and you have to do it in a way that sees the personhood of the other person, um, that doesn't lose track of who they are and what the image of Christ, um, the image of God that they're made in, um, and what it means to honour them and love them. So I think if we start with the person and nature of Christ and then the love that we have for um, humanity that God gives us as he's made in his image, then I think we can kind of move from there with gentleness. Um, but I don't think we're going to get to a point where we have agreement across the board, and I think in many ways that's a good thing. Um, I have ideas about social media stuff as well, but maybe I'll pause on that and we can come back to it, because I'd love to hear from Cam too. Well, I'm not up to date with social media, so I defer to you. You're pretty up to date on Zoom here, Ken. <laughs> You're a Zoomer. <laughs> uh, but I, I did want to, to say that, um, as Ashray said, this is a question that we can see right from the very beginning. In, in the New Testament, we can see it happening. Uh, for example, very early on, Paul had to face the question, do you have to become a Jew before you become a Christian? You have to be circumcised before you can be baptised as a Christian. Now, you remember that almost split the early church, and there were groups that went off almost from the beginning. I think again and again we have to come back to what is the ultimate source of authority? Now, quite rightly, Miriam says it is Christ, and then we have to ask the question, well, how do we know the authentic Christ? Because, as you doubtless know, people have created Christ in their own image in every culture and age. Coming back to the Reformation, and I don't want to turn this into a history lecture, and accept none of that, but the crucial thing for them was, the authority for them was, the Word of God. Now, they were not fundamentalists who have particular views on how the inspiration of the Bible came. That was a 19th century question. But for them, the crucial question was, where is ultimate truth found? God has revealed it. Where is the record of that revelation? In the Bible, in the scriptures. And that, of course, was the, the catalyst for the divisions that came, leading Luther to break with Rome, and indeed within the Reformation, leading different groups to emphasise different truths, if you like the, the Baptist kind of thing, disagreed with Luther uh, in many ways. But the common thing was Christ, ultimately, yes. There was a 20th century historian who said, about the future, be committed to Christ and uncommitted for anything else. But that's the crucial thing. And I think that remains. I think the danger about the, the um, what's the curl, you know, the phone sort of thing, what am I, what's the word I'm grabbing for? The, Miriam's going to put me right on in a minute. Social media. That's right. Fine. I think yes. the, the, the point about that is, of course, it's so individualistic, or it can be. And whilst we can find all kinds of networks and groups, you could be there out on your own advancing all kinds of bizarre theories, and people do, not least about the Christian faith. Mm. So the challenge for the digital age, I think, is how we are able to structure our common experience, our common life. To be committed to Christ and to be open, I think what Astro said is entirely right and important in terms of uh, loving one another, seeking the truth in love. I can only agree with that. I think that's hard to do online because, as I understand the little I do, you live in your own sort of world. You can do. That's exactly On right. the other hand, I, I readily admit it brings all kinds of connections. I've been connected to people in England and other places through Zoom that I hadn't seen for ages because that was the only way we could connect. No, I really appreciate those thoughts, Ken. The questions are coming in um, hard and fast now. So we've got a few minutes. We've got a few minutes left. So I'm going to do a speed round, and okay. we're going to just do a punchy 30 seconds. 
as quick as you can on each of these questions. So um, we'll start with you, Nick. Um, there's often a variety of, of opinions in, um, in each church community, even in Q. I have a variety of opinions in my own head. <laughs> but how do we um, give voice to, and these are questions coming in from the audience, uh, how do we give voice to those other opinions or hear those other opinions when um, only one view is primarily um, taught from the pulpit? Well, look, you know, I, I think we don't... I, I never say to people, look, you know, this is, this is how it, it has to be for, for everything, everyone. We, we teach and we preach from the Bible as best we can. And we say, read it for yourself, check it out for yourself. This is how we understand it. Um, but I think we're in this kind of, you know, egalitarian sort of culture in Australia where maybe it's moving into ideas that, that all ideas are equal and, and they're just not. I don't think that's true. Um, and Peter's writing to a Christian community, but, but there's not like 100 people writing to those Christian communities. We haven't... There were other letters going around in the first, second century. We kind of threw them away um, over time because we said that's not, that's not authoritative. That's not from... So we, we take the Scriptures, we, we teach them, we preach them. You know, we do so knowing that we're, we're not... You know, I don't see everything perfectly. But if you don't agree with something, you know, you're allowed to come, you're allowed to have questions, you're allowed to disagree. I mean, we don't kick people out if they don't agree with this view on one Peter. Um, so it's, it's a way of we need to interpret together. The community of faith needs to come together and listen to the Scriptures, listen to the Holy Spirit and, and walk and learn together about these things. Totally. Yeah, that's exactly right, Nick. And um, I'll try and keep the other... Try and keep the other answers as quick as possible, I guess. Um, to you, Ashray, how do you uh, just or how do you understand and reconcile there being a lot of things being done in the name of um, Christianity, even in today's political movements? People invoke the name of Jesus to justify what they're doing. So, how do we as believers, how should we make sense of those things? Well, to to be brief, I think. The, uh, the New Testament really uh, foreshadows that. I don't think it's something that's new. I don't think it's something that's going, to, that's going to come to an end before the final judgment. And indeed, to an extent, we know it's not from, uh, from what's been revealed to us, actually, that uh, throughout all ages, that there's, there's people who, who, claim to be, who, can, who claim to be providing an authentic Christianity who are, in fact, not. Um, I think the call on us as Christians then is to be discerning, and that's a very difficult thing. Um, it requires the help of the Holy Spirit, and um, it requires us to to search the Scripture for ourselves, and also to to turn to the church in, in the in the gathered um, in the gathering of other Christians, and in in those things to to seek out what is true and to discern what is true Christianity, and what is false Christianity. And that, that's very important because, as you say, there's a variety of people out there who are, who are presenting what they say. This is authentic Christianity. And some of them are close, some of them are far, and, uh, and all, all should be appraised by the believer. Yeah, that's really good. That's right. Uh, discernment is really important. Uh, Miriam, uh, how should uh, Christians view um, partnering with, I, I think the question is uh, referencing external social movements that aren't necessarily Christian. How should, should Christians partner with those movements in trying to seek justice, sh seek shalom in society, or should we try and steer, stick in our own lane and um, run, have Christian um, versions of those um, societal um, social movements? Sorry. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I'm going to take a little bit from what Ken was saying earlier in the early the early church, and, and I think the church should not be distinguished as an isolated um, bubble. So I think by our very nature, we are engaging with the rest of society and with the rest of the world. And therefore, it's healthy to, with discernment and with thought, think about um, what does it mean to be involved with what's happening in society, whether that is day-to-day um, -day stuff or a bigger um, social movement or social engagement. I think... Um, the two things I'd sort of hold up are the concept of a uh, question of idolatry. So at what point am I moving Jesus off the throne and putting something else on there instead? Um, and sometimes in our passion and pursuit of justice, um, 
we forget the one who gives us justice and who teaches us how to live it. So I think I would want to look for, um, am I idolizing my own commitments, my own priorities, my own associations, or my identity uh, over Jesus and his nature and who I'm relating to in him? Um, so I think I would want that to be always my primary relationship. And so to hold things lightly, to be able to move in and out of things lightly. Um, and that's why I think it's important to think about it's also okay for people to test and discern and to change their minds. Um, and if Jesus and the Bible and the Holy Spirit are the things that are central, then as we weigh and look at what's going on in society, we will change our minds. We will have shifting opinions. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but I don't think there's a problem with being active and involved in what's going on in society. I think as followers of Christ, we should be because we're not called to abandon society. Um, we're working towards a kingdom that is not yet, but that is, um, there's an element of it that's now that we're called to work out now as well. So I think that's Can I just add to that answer. very helpful uh, comment by Miriam that I think it was Francis Schaeffer who said, that we have to make a distinction. We, we might well want to support a particular movement. We might want to march with uh, Black Lives Matter or whatever, but we can make a distinction between identifying with everything that a particular protest movement might want to do. We can say on this issue, because of the gospel, because of understanding of the kingdom of God in our midst, I want to march with you. It doesn't mean that I'm going to act with you on every aspect. So that in a sense, we can say, I'm here as a Christian, and this is why I'm here, and I'll be as committed as anybody else. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to go along with you and on your worldview and a whole lot of other things. And I think that distinction has always been helpful to me anyway. Mm. That's really good, Ken. And I think and that's a great place to end tonight. Uh, if you have more questions, send them through. We'll get to them uh, maybe in a QA and a podcast. Uh, but there's heaps more I wish I could have got to. They're really good questions. Uh, Nick, would you like to just close in prayer for us um, sure. as we uh, Thank you, Tom and Miriam, Ashray and Ken. Actually, I won't close in prayer. Amanda, uh, my wife, is going to come and close in prayer just in a moment. But I will say just to close, uh, you know, I, I notice, you know, the, the situation in Victoria and, and just in the world generally, I think there's a lot of fear and anxiety around now. I'm finding myself quite tempted towards fear and anxiety at times. And I think we need to acknowledge that as as Christians, followers of Jesus, that we we do sense that in our culture and our um, it things feels like things are, are just coming apart a little bit. But I just want to encourage you to to acknowledge that and to to be open to God about some of the anxieties and fears you might be experiencing about um, the pandemic, about social unrest, all those sorts of things. Uh, and it's it's okay to to feel afraid or be anxious, but just bring it to God and and uh, and know that He can give you peace. Uh, even when other things are not peaceful in your life and the world. And so I invite Amanda up to come and pray for us, and then we're going to sing a beautiful song afterwards, which is a prayer, which calls us to come to God and to bring Him our lives, the, our brokenness, the fullness of everything that's happening, uh, and we'll sing that together as our prayer. So thanks, Amanda. I'm going to give Amanda this microphone because we're married, so you, we share germs. <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom, for leading in that tonight. Um, the Apostle Peter quotes Isaiah 28 in his letter, and he says that Jesus is a gift and that he is our precious cornerstone and that if we trust in him, we will not be put to shame. He doesn't say that we will not suffer, but as Christ's followers, we will stand before him one day having lived a life honouring him and giving our whole heart to him. But before we pray, I want to ask you tonight, is Jesus your precious cornerstone? In the midst of everything, the chaos and the stuff of life, is he your anchor? Are you pursuing holiness? Do you know your inheritance in Christ? Would you join with me now as we bring our heart, our mind, our soul to our Father God in prayer? Peter says in his letter, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oh, dearest Lord, I must confess I have felt sad and afraid this week. I felt sad and afraid about more COVID-19 cases and what that might mean. I felt sad and afraid about hard-working people whose businesses are being destroyed through border closures and restrictions. I felt sad and afraid for people living on their own and who were lonely for people suffering depression and people living in abusive situations. I felt sad and afraid for people overseas who were displaced and who were dying of hunger and cold in desolation. I felt so sad for those who have suffered prejudice and hate in their lives, the precious souls you look at with tear-stained eyes, People you died for, people you wove together in a mother's womb, people you rejoice over. And Lord, I felt really sad for the good police officers over the last few weeks who've received a lot of abuse. And these good police officers, Lord, would lay down their own lives to come with compassion to care and protect another person. Lord, I feel sad for the lack of dignity and respect now in our society. And I feel sad for the little ones, our children, who must be wondering what on earth is going on and and how they should be thinking and feeling through all of this. And I also feel sad for a beautiful family who used to come to this church, Kobe and James docking after the death of Kobe's beloved mother, Florina. Oh, Lord, what words could ever convey what they are feeling right now? The raw grief, the numbness, the emotional exhaustion. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. For Kobe and James and for everyone and Everything I've mentioned tonight in this prayer, all the things that make me sad and afraid, I and all my brothers and sisters, we lift up our little hearts to you tonight and we say that we need you so much. Suffering teaches us that you can't just be someone we know about. The chaos in this world tells us that we either desire all of you or else we live in our own strength and that won't get us very far. Your word says that we are the people of God. If we actually believe this, our hearts would be singing right now, knowing that you are our destiny. And though the world is temporary and it's messy, You say to the sun, rise, and up it comes. You say to the wind, blow, and it blows. You say to the rain, rain down and fill the earth, and it does. Lord, you're in the laughter of children. You're in the songs of the birds. You're in the smile of a random person that we pass in the street. You're the breath in our lungs. You're the fire in our hearts. As we with courage live our days knowing that we're not alone, we honour you tonight, our Father God. We hear you call our name and we come. We come with our broken hearts and open hands and we come with joy and hope knowing that you are wonderful and you are holy, and you are true, and you stand above it all. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. 
Amén.